think we're going to get started. So thanks everyone for joining the webinar today, Path to a Business PhD. My name is Christina Pazos and I'm the Outreach and Program Manager for the PhD project. I want to send a special thank you to Justin Bailey, Relationships Manager at Gates Millennium Scholars Program, who collaborated with me to host this event. A run through of today's event, uh, we will hear from Blaine Ruschak, President of the PhD Project and the KPMG US Foundation, who will provide us some information about the PhD project. Dr. Ronald Ramirez will then discuss life as a professor before our panelists join him. We will have an open discussion and try to answer many of your questions. So please use the Q&A box below to drop your questions in that area. And we will do our best to answer most of them now or as a follow-up to this session. Also, please use the comment box to introduce yourself and let us know where you are joining us from. The session is being recorded and we'll share that playback link with you once available. Okay, so I think we are ready. Blaine, let's get started. Thanks, Christina, and, and welcome everybody. Thanks for, for joining us today. And I know you are gonna have an amazing session. We have a, a great panel. Um, my name is Blaine Ruschek. I'm the president of the PhD project, which I'll talk about in, in a little bit, um, but also president of the KPMG US Foundation. Um, I'm gonna share a quick story. You know, when I went to school many, many years ago, um, I went to two schools to get my undergraduate and then a third school for my graduate degree. And during that entire time, so, you know, actually six years of education, had zero faculty of color at three schools. And when I look back, you know, what a missed opportunity and a shame it was. And when I think about my classmates in my classrooms, very little diversity. So back in 1994, KPMG Foundation looked at that issue of lack of diversity in business schools and thought, well, maybe the problem is that there's not diversity in front of the classroom. And so they initiated what is now called the PhD project 26 years ago. Um, and basically the premise was, if we can get more um, you know, African-American, Black, Hispanic, Latinx, and Native American Indian um, professionals to leave their careers, go get their PhDs and become professors in the classroom. All right, so be those mentors and those leaders and the educators, as well as researchers doing some amazing research on current issues um, that that might encourage students of color to major in business. And so 26 years ago, we started the program. Um, and, you know, since that program, we had amazing results. So I'll quickly share, you know, some of the other results. So next, Christine. Right. So you know, we have a number of organizations that have joined on because they've bought into the, the, the same premise and they support the PhD project. And you can see a lot of organizations in the financial services industry and in the accounting industry, um, marketing and management. So all the business disciplines are participating and supporting the project. And it basically sends the message that, you know, everyone realizes that this was an issue that needed to be addressed. And that's what the PhD project has done for 26 years. Next. Um, so what we're trying to do is create this, this equitable environment where people see that they have, you know, a, a multiple career paths and opportunities that students of color can come into the classroom, you know, have this amazing experience. And then once again, I, I think, you know, when we look at the cycle, it's, you know, join, you know, corporate America, you know, have a successful career and then selfishly thinking that down the road, say, you know what? I'd like to get a PhD and become that professor that's going to be that role model in the classroom. So we look at it as a full cycle of the diverse faculty attracting diverse students, diverse students getting an amazing business education, uh, joining corporate America, and then someday maybe looking at getting a PhD themselves. And hopefully that's, you know, you're, what you're tuning in today is to learn more about um, what it means, you know, to be a, a PhD in business. Next. You can see that as we look at statistics, um, the, the representation in the classroom in terms of the faculty is not representing demographics of the student. And that's one of the things that we're working really hard on with the PhD project um, is to increase the diversity of faculty. And I'll show some stats in a minute in terms of what we've been able to do. But we would definitely love to have, you know, all of you on this call, if you think this might be an, an option for you or a calling for you, consider um, looking at our November conference where it all starts, where we introduce what the PhD is, you spend three days learning about, you know, what a true PhD is, and hopefully that encourages you to apply for and enter a PhD program. And you'll hear some of our panels talk about that today. Next. Um, think about impact. And I think, you know, a lot of us, 
you know, it may be different points in your life where you're going, well, I really want to look at the purpose and, and the impact I'm having. And when we look at the PhD project, when you think about becoming a, a professor, so we'll use an example. Let's say that you go to university and you teach four classes a year. So two in the spring, two in the fall, and each class has 50 students, right? So that's, you know, you know 200 students and, you know, that you're co covering for that year. And multiply that by 15 or 20 years. That's impact just directly on those students. And then think about those students now going into kind of the business world and having an impact on those around them. So it's a huge impact that you can have. So one can have an impact on many. And as an adjunct faculty, um, you know, myself at a number of universities, I truly love the feeling of being able to impact students to get their minds thinking, to get them thinking about why they'd want to look into a topic or research it or understand it better. So, um, you know, I think you're gonna hear some, some great advice and, and tips from the panelists today. Next. Um, so I'm gonna conclude there. Um, I really want to thank you all for joining. I, I know that um, you know that time is valuable these days, but our, our panelists have a, a great session in store. I also want to thank Christina from the PhD Project for helping to organize and run today's session. And with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ramirez. So uh, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, lovely event. You know, I just saw on my slide how uh, I actually, I went to the original or the first inaugural PhD conference back in 1994. So that gives you an idea wow. of uh, how much hair I used to have back then. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I've been around the KPMG, pro the PhD project and the different doctoral associations since uh, the beginning. So it's been a very exciting uh, journey. And so I'm very happy to be here today to talk to you. Uh, for those that are considering um, pursuing a PhD in business. So next slide, please. Um, so, uh, you know, what is the role of a business professor, as this slide says? Uh, I can talk about my role. Um, when you start out as a, a business professor, as an assistant professor, you, you go through different stages in your career, but at, at all stages you teach, in the business uh, degree programs of your school. So that could include undergraduate programs, uh, graduate programs like master's programs, as well as uh, doctoral programs. So I'm at currently the business school at the University of Colorado Denver, and I've taught in all three of those programs. And uh, so the second role of a professor is to conduct research. And so that's where you develop new knowledge for the academy, as we like to call it. So for the uh, fellow researchers out there at the different professors at the different business schools, as well as uh, for practice. So one important thing you'll do is you may do your, your peer academic research, but you want to make sure that you're able to translate that into practice to help business and organizations as they evolve and in innovate. And uh, one way you publish that research to get it out to the academy and to practitioners is you publish your research in journals and books. And it's, we'll, we'll talk maybe a little bit about tenure, but oftentimes academic journals are what's most important uh, during your tenure journey. And then finally, your third role as a professor is service. And in that role, you, you can volunteer to do many different things. It could be from campus level service where you're serving on university committees, it can be uh, service to the community, such as volunteering uh, at the KPMG project, or it can also include service to the business school. And so I didn't talk really about my role, but as uh, currently, but after becoming an assistant professor, um, you go on uh, to get tenure and get promoted to an associate professor. And there at that point, you have several career paths you can choose. Uh, you can go to full professor, which is everybody's goal, but also you can go into administration. And that is my current role right now be, beyond doing research and teaching. I'm also the associate dean of programs at the business school, like I said, at CU Denver. So that's just a general overview of the role of a business professor. So next, please. All right, so when you think about paths to a PhD in business, I can uh, talk about this slide, but also reflect upon my own journey. So yeah, the first thing, of course, obviously is you need an undergraduate degree. So for me, I had a bachelor in science in electrical engineering. And like the path on the left talks about, I actually went out and got a full-time position working for 
uh, the Chevron Corporation as a, uh, a network analyst. So working on their computer network. And while I was in that role, uh, I, I fell into a liking on, on the business and management side of technology. And so uh, back in those days, if you were interested uh, in management and you didn't have a business degree, you'd pursue an MBA. So as you see here in this path, you, you, on the left side, you can go into your MBA program. And after the MBA program, I went and actually did, worked again but on the management side in a technology company before I decided to pursue my PhD in business. Now, there, are, you, you can go straight into a PhD program from your undergraduate studies. You don't need to have any work experience. You can go straight in, or you can join at any one of those lines as it's shown here on the slide. One thing I will say, it, it does benefit to have work experience when you're in front of the classroom. So certainly, uh, well, actually all level, undergraduate, masters, and PhD students like when you can relate uh, the theory and the different concepts you're teaching to practical business. And the one way you're obviously able to talk about practical business is if you have that work experience. But it's important to understand that you, you don't necessarily uh, need to, you can go straight from your undergraduate degree into a PhD program if that's what you'd like to do. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so when you're in a doctoral program, uh, as I really may lead to later, one of our panelists. Um, there are different stages in the doctoral program. The first stage, the most important stage is the coursework. Um, it can be very challenging, but you have to learn different things. You need to learn your topic or your discipline, the concepts there. You need to learn about the methods of research. So how do I conduct research? And then oftentimes it's very beneficial to study in a second area, sort of when you think about the undergraduate studies, you can minor in an area. So in a PhD program, it's good if you can study in multiple disciplines. So in my area uh, at UC Irvine, where I pursued my PhD, earned my PhD, I studied uh, in the management area and also in economics. So after coursework, uh, there could be an exam, but um, it, it, as it shows there, you also try to conduct research. So oftentimes you'll work with your professors, actually maybe from your courses, and you try to uh, start off conducting research on your own. You may try to publish it, for example, in a conference. Uh, so it varies by program, but that's obviously a step you should try to do. Um, but once you're done with that coursework phase, the big thing comes the exams. And these, these, the type and format of the exam will vary by the university you're at. So as it says there, it could be a written and oral examination. Uh, it could also be a comprehensive examination. It just depends again on the university. Where I went, I had one exam written and oral that took place after the second year. Uh, and uh, really could perhaps talk about the exams she has to take here at UC Denver. And then finally, after you uh, pass your comprehensive exam, you go into the dissertation phase. And the first thing you need to do there is to develop a dissertation proposal and then defend that proposal. Uh, and then uh, once the committee that you uh, work with approves the proposal, you go out and you collect your data, you conduct your analysis, you build your theoretical model, and then you empirically test that model with that data. And then you write your dissertation and have your defense. Now the length of time can vary by the student and the program you're in. Um, oftentimes it can take four years. More often it can take a little bit longer. Um, the best prepared candidate to go look for jobs in the professor market are those that have not only the dissertation completed, but publications in journals and conferences. So when you think about your path to becoming a professor, um, oftentimes people will talk about four years for the journey to earn the PhD degree but you also have to think about being the best prepared candidate for the job market. And so think about publishing papers again when you're in your PhD program. Okay, next slide. All right, so when you think about, um, you know, do I need, for example, a business degree? Do I need any certain type of degree or skill? Well, in general, you need quantitative and qualitative skills. You, know, you need to be able to handle statistics and mathematics, especially if you're doing empirical work. 
So if you're doing econometrics or anything of that nature. So uh, it's good to have some of those classes in your undergraduate program or in your master's program, but you don't necessarily need those classes. Uh, when you start a PhD program, um, obviously you may have to take an exam, the GMAT test, uh, and you could get in uh, to a program based solely uh, on the score in your test. And then if you have any shortfalls in maths or statistics or any area, oftentimes the programs will allow you to take those classes to come up to speed. And in fact, prior to the start of your program, they may even have a boot camp when it comes to math and statistics. Uh, and that's what I did prior to my PhD program. And then obviously when you're writing your dissertation, you're writing journal papers and conference papers, uh, writing is a key skill you need to have. And so um, you have to learn how to write like an academic as well. And oftentimes you can learn that through practice. So those are just two general skills that you need. So you don't necessarily need to have studied a certain degree uh, prior to your PhD in business, but you need to have these core skills. Next slide. Okay, and so uh, as mentioned before that you know, PhD project has been very successful in its mission. It's increased um, the number of faculty in front of the classroom by already a multiple of five. Um, as you can see, there's some st statistics about between 1994 and 2021, the just raw number increase of minority faculty in front of the business classroom in the US. And one thing as well, when you uh, uh, do start your PhD program and you're part of the KPMG project, you can also take advantage of the doctoral student associations. And I think those doctoral student associations is a group of peers in your area of study. And they uh, will actually help mentor you and support you in the completion of your doctoral program. And I think that's why we see the PhD project students graduate at a much higher rate than the US average. So this, uh, I know for myself personally, this program was, was very helpful to my success as a PhD student, as well as launching my career as a faculty member. And so you'll see those uh, great success rates here on this slide. So next, please. All right, so, uh, you know, part of this uh, event, we're gonna have a panel. And so I think at this uh, point, we're gonna have our panelists introduce themselves. So we're gonna start off with Aurelia. Hi everyone, my name is Aurelia Mandani and I am currently a third year PhD student at the University of Colorado at Denver. Um, Dr. Ramirez is actually my advisor and mentor through the PhD project and my advisor on campus. My area of study is in cybersecurity and we can get more into the details of that. I am, as a third year PhD student, I recently completed my comps last summer. So I am ABD all but dissertation, which means that I am currently working on my dissertation proposal. So if any of you have any questions about what that process looks like, or even what my comprehensive exams look like um, at specifically the University of Colorado at Denver, which is pictured here, um, feel free to ask and I am happy to answer any questions that any of you may have. Next up, we have Dr. Renee Pratt, and she's going to talk about herself. Thank you, Aurelia. Um, good afternoon. Uh, so my name is Dr. Renee Pratt, and I am a professor at the University of North Georgia. Um, and my area of interest in research specifically focuses on enterprise resource systems, in particular within the healthcare industry. Um, so a lot of our EHR systems, and uh, as noted, um, feel free to ask any questions about particular research area as well as anything else that I, I'm discussing. Um, my actual undergraduate degree is in mathematics, so I started in the STEM area, and so um, I'm happy to share how that impacts and affects uh, my decision to end up getting a, a PhD in, in MIS and in management information systems and now being part of um, a department that is actually both computer science and information systems. So I attended the PhD project in 2002 and it has been an absolute wonderful aspect of my career. 
Um, and, and similarly to Dr. Ramirez, it has helped me grow in my program as well as a faculty member. And many of my dearest friends today are individuals that I met through the PhD project. Uh, in addition, there are other lots of opportunities and things that we can do as faculty. And one of the things that um, I'm very proud of is my moment as a Fulbright Research Scholar in which I actually spent um, nearly a year in Germany focusing and examining on their healthcare system and the comparisons with, with us in the United States and other countries. So um, there are a number of aspects in which we'll be exploring today, but um, note that I do, as I mentioned, I come from a mathematics degree with a computer science and information systems for my master's, um, and then eventually moving into the uh, management of information systems within the business school. Next. Mute. Okay. So uh, it's a time for our panel. Uh, and so what I'll do is I'll perhaps ask a question and then uh, we can start answering as panelists. So uh, I'll chime in here and there, but uh, I guess perhaps let's start off with Aurelia. Uh, how did your prior work experience prepare you for a doctoral program? Yes, so I gave a very brief overview of my background. Um, so just a little bit more on my background. I got my bachelor's in political science and in international relations. And that actually helped me prepare for basically almost the business side of things because I had a economics and political economy background with my degree from there. Uh, my master's is in library and information science with a focus in IT. So um, although it is a librarian degree, my IT focus really helped me prepare for my program, which is a similar to where Dr. Pratt teaches at, um, where Dr. Ramirez and I are at, at University of Colorado at Denver. The information systems uh, program is a computer science and information systems program. I'm just doing an IS focus, an information systems uh, focus. So before joining the program, I was working as a librarian slash a user experience researcher. So I had a kind of a mixed methods background on how to conduct research. And that really prepared me for learning how to understand the different methodologies that are used in IS research. And within that, during my time through my PhD, I worked as a cybersecurity professional. As you probably are um, seen in my, um, for the Gates Scholars here, I'm also a Gates Scholar. Um, so the information systems degree program is covered through the Gates scholarship. It's one of the seven funded areas. So if you have questions about that, I'm happy to answer it. But that's also what led me to a degree path, a PhD path in computer science and information systems because of the opportunities that were available through the Gates Foundation. Dr. Pratt, your uh, work experience history? Um, so as I mentioned, my undergrad was in mathematics. And so from there, I actually went on to work for both the city and the city of Miami and the state of Florida eventually, in which I focused on, I actually got more into the computer side using my mathematics to help develop systems for the uh, um, uh, physics areas within and, 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 um, and essentially like control of, of our building situation. So building construction and so forth for the state and the city. And so that's kind of where my interests began. And I started to branch out beyond that in which I started developing databases and websites. And that was sort of the time where it's like, okay, this, we're in the, the, the start of the bubble, right? Um, and so at that point, I actually transitioned and moved to Atlanta and I was working there. Um, for a company that focuses on web hosting and web development, but I was the head of internal um, coding. And so in that respect, what I began to see was really that a lot of times the programmers and coders and developers didn't have an understanding sometimes of what the sales side perspective of and what do our, in, what do our clients need and want. And when it really became more a concern was that when we started having individuals 
leading our department that were non-technical, but they had the business knowledge. And so um, this really drove the question for me of like, how do we merge these two? How do we get you know, a group of individuals who both understand the people side as well as the technology side? And that is sort of where my idea of like, well, this is really a question to be like explored. And I wanna, I wanna be able to give that back to my community as well. Um, and this really fueled my thought of, I'm gonna go probably eventually go back and get my grad school degree. So I went and I, and I ended up getting, a, like I said, a master's in information systems and focusing on my program I actually had, a, since I had the technical background, they spent a little more time on the business perspective and understanding people and applying technology to that. Um, and that's where I realized, okay, I, this is my area. I am enjoying this, I am loving it. Um, and I was introduced, I received a flyer from the PhD project in the mail and I said, you know, let me find out more about this. What, what is that? And so it really helps to prepare me to give me a question. Um, so as you're writing your applications into your programs and you're trying to explain what, what your interests are, um, one of the things you know we're looking as faculty is we're in, looking at your applications. Why do you want to do this? What's of interest? Do you have a question in mind already? Um, and so that really helped prepare me for providing a question and for giving me some direction. Now, when you're in the program, a lot of times, depending on who your advisor is, you may end up taking different routes and, and different angles. Um, and I think that's the big thing is preparing you and understanding that you are open to different ideas and concepts because um, how we view and how we have seen technology and how technology applies in business um, is such a vast area that prior to you entering into a doctoral program, you, you only get to see a snippet of it in your career. Um, and so that really helped kind of to give me that, that push and that advantage into the direction of the doctoral program. Um, and then the understanding of technology and science definitely helps, it provides discipline and other aspects that helped with understanding the statistical knowledge, as well as just um, being able to sort of craft your projects and your ideas in ways that make sense and are logical. Yeah, so th that's that's a good point. You know, your background does help shape your research and and your you know your research questions, your interest area, also helps shape how you do your work. And so, I, you know, I hadn't thought about that, but what, back prior to my PhD program. I had a question about, I would see millions of dollars being spent in, in computers and technology in the company I worked for in the CFO's office. And I would often ask the question, is this investment really worth it? So that led to my core question of, are organizations receiving a value from their technology investment? And that actually led me to my doctoral program because uh, uh, Irvine was an area that was studying that exact question. I had no idea that after I investigated and applied, I found out, look, they're doing exactly my area of interest from the practical side. But, and maybe you both have covered this, but real quickly, when you were considering a PhD, because right now we're talking a little bit about prior to your PhD, what led you to take that action to then apply, to actually take that step? So Dr. Pratt, why don't you start? Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, I, I went on and did my master's. And um, so as I was coming out of my master's, I did a one year um, accelerated program. And I was about to start on as a senior consultant for a firm in IT. And that was just about the time our market was starting to get a little shaky. <laughs> And so, um, so a lot of companies were already just turning down newly graduate students that they had already accepted offers and were telling them, sorry, we don't have a position anymore because of market. And uh, so this was the time where I started saying, okay, I have an opportunity now to try to do something different and to look at it differently. And this, that's really what pushed me into that point. So I still, I was lucky. I was one of the lucky ones. I still actually had my position. Um, but I went ahead and I chose to uh, explore something else. And so I worked for about a year after um, my, under my, my master's and then applied to programs and decided at that point that this was a great time. I think initially in my mind, I had always perceived I wanted to do a PhD. I did not know it would be in this area. Of course, when I was an undergrad, I just assumed it was either the mathematics. Um, but I thought it was much later in life. And so I think what one of the things we've explored and seen is that, you know, when I was in school, most of my professors were much, much older. And so there was this mindset 
that, oh, it's what I do when I retire or after I've put in 20 years of work experience and then go back and do it. Um, and, and things have changed, right? <laughs> so, so now it's like, oh, I don't have to wait till then. I can do that earlier and I can, I can do that in my career now. And so that's really what was the push for me. I realized, why not now? Why, this is a great time, a great opportunity. Um, and I'm able to, to do that, so. And really, what about, what about you? Yeah, so what really got me into going into a PhD and applying was that in my master's degree in uh, information science, I was focusing my research on behaviors of individuals. And as I was completing my master's degree, I realized that well, the behaviors are important, but what about the systems that the users are using? What, how can I apply that to my, my research? How can I really understand the connection points, especially as a user experience researcher? I really wanted to understand the relationship between the two, how the systems worked with the users and what balancing mechanisms, if any, were there um, when we're speaking about app development and website development and even just user experience in the physical spaces like in businesses and how people travel and use um, spaces such as stores or what have you. So as I started talking to my advisor about this, she actually had a previous student that was a PhD student in my current program right now. And she said, I think you need to apply to this program. And I said, oh, wow, okay. Uh, uh, even though I'm not really business focused, this seems like a, a perfect path for me because I am very interested in the technology. And so that led me to um, figuring out what a PhD in business meant um, because it is a little different when um, we talk about a computer science and information systems program. Um, most of them are actually in a business school um, for a large percentage of those programs. So I didn't know what that entailed. And I had taken a few MBA classes in my master's program, but I really didn't have that full knowledge and understanding. So as soon as I figured that out, I was like, this is the path for me and I'm going to apply for it. And thankfully it was one of the covered areas for the Gates Foundation. Um, so that's what really got me into applying was just realizing that this is a area where I could broaden my knowledge and scope of research so that I could really help um, understand these questions, these research questions that I was building up in my master's program. Okay, great. Um, uh, now, so we're here we are in our panel, we're talking about uh, prior to your uh, entry into a PhD program, there was a question from the audience. Maybe Dr. Pratt, you can talk about this. You talked about candidates. So is there a question from the audience was, is there any advice uh, uh, on strengthening an application? Uh, and then I'm, par I'm paraphrasing this question. Do I need to have publications or have done existing research? Um, sure, uh, definitely, I'm happy to answer that. Um, so, I'll, so I'll say, so you don't need to have previous publications or written demonstration that you can write or produce uh, prior to entering a program. Now I will say, if you have it, that's an awesome addition, right? So, so it doesn't mean, but if you don't have it, don't worry, don't feel like, oh my gosh, I've got to hurry up and find someone to work with. Um, but if you have the opportunity, if you're still in school right now and you have an interest, you know, pair with a faculty member, one of your faculty members, to work on a project together. They're always usually open to working on things, having you maybe do a little bit of data analysis or help collect data, um, you know, just different aspects of it. So there are ways in which you can per perform by either maybe entering a conference paper or um, doing a submission, as I said, with a faculty member. So those are definitely helpful, but they're not necessary or required. Um, as far as trying to improve or build on your application, you know, outside of the standard aspects of making sure you're meeting the proper score requirements based on the institution um, and the necessary other um, requirements as far as school, what we're looking for is to find a good fit. 
And so what you wanna be really focusing on is the story that you're telling us and how it's related to what the faculty at that institution do. Um, we wanna work with individuals who want to work on similar types of topics, who have similar interests. So if your interest is in analytics and no one by chance at this particular institution does analytics, that's probably not gonna appeal to them as much. They're going to say, oh, you're, you'll be a better fit somewhere else. Um, so I, what you wanna think about is think hard about what type of question you have. And we understand that you're, you shouldn't have your question laid out and like, this is my only question and this is what I wanna find out. Um, because we're gonna change that, trust me. <laughs> the likelihood of you getting the opportunity, a lot of times your questions are things that you're gonna end up choosing to work on your own after the fact. Um, but getting into the program and aligning yourself with a faculty member, um, look at what the faculty member has done. Pay attention to the types of research they do or the type of work they do, and then uh, try to appeal to them. Um, you don't wanna try to fit yourself with every single member. There's try to create some kind of a focus to say that you've demonstrated that you've actually you know, reviewed and examined who is in that department and how they work and what they do and how you would be a good fit for that department. Great, yeah, and, and fit is really important, I would say. And, and uh, Okay, so let's move now. Let's uh, assume now we're in a program. We've, we've, uh, we've taken that brave step and we've applied and we've left potentially our job and we started a PhD program. Now, we don't have much time, but how would you describe your doctoral experience? So let's hear from Aurelia. She's in it now, and I'm sure she's only going to have positive things since I'm her advisor, but please speak freely. <laughs> yeah, so actually, I, I really, really enjoy and love research. And so it's a big part of just all of the past, you know, positions that I've had before. I've always done research on human behavior. And so being able to research it and find and discover a dissertation on my research area has been really helpful. And as Dr. Pratt said, your research areas will continuously shape and grow as you continue throughout your PhD. So just for a quick context, I started off wanting to do um, specifically governance and IT, and I didn't know what areas with it, with governance IT I wanted to research, but I knew that that was what I was really interested in is understanding how, the, how that works within the business realm. And I was good at cybersecurity, but I didn't realize that that could be an area that I could focus on really, um, because I didn't know, I'm not an expert in it, but it's also a new area. And Dr. Ramirez said, go for it. And that's kind of just the path that I've been on, just honing in on those skills that I have um, from website development and security and morphing it into a business question. And so that has been super helpful. And my experience has been great. The only thing is, is that uh, in the PhD program, whatever program you're in, it will get stressful. And so the biggest thing is you have to have a community of support. I'm very thankful that the PhD project has allowed for me to network with other students who are in the same, in similar programs and are going through the same things. And so when it was comprehensive time last summer during the pandemic, all of us that were getting ready to take our comprehensive exams, um, literally we would call each other and be like, hey, your, your comprehensive exam is in two weeks, right? Okay, let's schedule another meeting and debrief with you know, how we're feeling. And then we scheduled another meeting after all of us finished. And it was just a great way to have community. Um, PhD programs are not easy and I'm like smiling about it, but there were definitely times where I was like, oh my goodness, I don't know if this is for me um, because it is a commitment. It is a very, it is something that you have to really put your all into, but so far I'm seeing the rewards from it and it's been great. Um, I've I've been um, involved with different conferences and whatnot, and it's made my experience really great. That's, that's good. And so, you know, Dr. Pratt, what about your uh, doctoral experience in Mike Aurelia? You know, what was some uh, what were some of the biggest challenges you faced? Sure. Um, I think usually the first wake up call once you enter the program is reading. 
<laughs> right? Uh, right. Um, I think most of us feel like we're pretty confident. We know how to read. We, you know, <laughs> we've made it through at least undergrad. We know how to do that. Um, but it, I think it is a challenge and it's learning how to read the way academics read. And, and, and it is a different type of reading if you've never read an academic journal. Um, you know, a lot of times this is the first time you're really doing that. And you, you're in seminars that are asking you to read 10 and 12 articles a week, you know, per, so um, per seminar, parts, depending, right? So it's quite a bit amount of reading. So I think, you know, a lot of the initial challenge is just kind of re- organizing your mind to think about things differently, to highlight things differently. So that was a tough one. Um, but I think that's where the PhD project was a really great help. Um, and with the PhD project, one of the benefits is that you meet every year with your group and it's usually right before the school year starts. And so it's an opportunity to catch up on tools that can be used. So things like EndNotes and reference tools and statistical items, as well as reading materials. and your fellow you know, peers are in courses and programs similar to yours and they're able to say, oh, no, no, I read that, this is that, and this is that, you know, um, or here's a new tool that I learned about that's been really cool. And so um, sometimes it helps because you end up being even with the help of the PhD project and similar types of programs, you end up ahead of your fellow classmates at your program. So a lot of times I would go in for the year and then I'm like, oh, are you using this tool, this tool really will help you manage your citations and your references. And they're looking at me like, where did you get this? How do you know about this? And so I found that that was really a great help um, through the process. The other really challenging thing is just, I think, you know, um, learning how to do an actual project from beginning to end and, and going through the process of building your research, understanding your research. And then of course, as Aurelia just did recently, take her exams and get through that. Um, uh, it is a learning process. The first two years usually are your, are your courses. And then from there you move into, as you noted, working on your dissertation. And so um, also that relationship that you build with your committee that's helping you to design that, that dissertation is really important and critical. And that's gonna be the thing that really helps you cross the finish line. Yeah, and so I think it is important to think about your program in steps. You know, you don't want to think you have to tackle it all at once. And that first step is, you know, is the coursework stage and you really need to get through that because those courses can be tough. Uh, we had a question from the audience. Uh, you know, when is a good year to start preparing for your dissertation proposal? What do you think about that, Dr. Pratt? Um, well, if you can, they always say as soon as possible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, so as you noted, the coursework is important and, and critical, but I think what helps is as you're going through your courses, most of your seminars are going to ask you to write a paper or submit something to a conference. This is your opportunity to explore different ideas and thoughts that you might have for your dissertation. And this is also a, an, an opportunity for you to build a stream of knowledge. And so as Aurelia is exploring her cybersecurity, right, she's able to really now all of the papers she writes, she may be writing them from different angles and different topics, but they have some realm of cybersecurity. And so that helps to build a broad idea and vision. And so that being said, essentially, after you've, you've passed your exams is when you begin exploring the question that you want to address for your dissertation. And usually it's somewhere probably within the next six months to a year um, based on what you discuss with your committee as to when you would actually present your uh, proposal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and it, you know, it is important to explore in the beginning, I, in the perfect world, you know, what you're doing is all around a common theme, which is going to align with your dissertation. But, um, you know, exactly like you said, start early. Okay, so we're still in the program stage. I want to be mindful of time. Uh, you know, there was a question about um, if I'm interested in interdisciplinary uh, research, um, what are some tips for um, trying to start that or build uh, or explore interdisciplinary research? I might say, if you have an interest in that and you're not already in a PhD program, you know, when you're exploring programs at different universities, oftentimes if you look at the professor's research record, They'll, it'll inform if they do interdisciplinary research. And the second thing too is I think it's also worthwhile talking to professors 
at a school you're thinking about applying to and ask that question, do you focus on interdisciplinary research? Uh, is it valued at your school? Because that'll give you an indication of whether or not it's, it's done. Um, but I wanna get to this other question from the audience. Again, I'm being mindful of time. We're in the current program. We did hear about some challenges, but I think there was a very good question. Uh, what about family life balance when you're a PhD student? And I'll, I'll just say uh, you know, there are many challenges and that is one of them, a balance. And I'll just tell you my own experience at Irvine. So I was in these classes where Dr. Pratt said, you have to read 12 articles in a week and I'm taking two or four classes. It just depends on the semester. But what was my schedule like? Uh, luckily, my wife had a full-time job, was consulting, so she had to work 80 hours a week because that's what I would work, to be honest. I would work Monday through Saturday. Saturday, I would work until 5 p.m., and then I would take like 12 hours off, and then I would work some more. And, and it just, I was lucky that my, my spouse at the time had a similar schedule. And that was a challenge, family life balance. So this is a voluntary question. Would anyone like to comment about family life balance? Okay. Anyone? Right, I'll, okay. I'll comment. I was, <laughs> I was just waiting to see if Aurelia wanted to comment first. I'd like to speak if she wanted to. Um, so uh, agreed. I think um, finding that balance, it, it is a challenge. It is absolutely a challenge. Um, you will need to really, I think, sit down with your significant other and explain, my time is now going to be significantly directed to this particular program um, and what that might mean and what, might, what that might look like. And you'll have to have this conversation several times over. Um, because unfortunately, if they're not in a program, most people probably don't truly have a good understanding of what a PhD program can, can, can entail. Um, and so what I will say for me in a personal experience, so when I started my program, um, I was single and I uh, was able to, I was lucky enough that my parents, I think after the first semester saw how challenging it was for me. Um, and they actually came up and moved nearby for a year to help me um, just manage my household and, and just take care of daily activities and things like that so that I could focus on studies. Um, and so they were like, look, you focus on that, we'll handle dinner and laundry, you know? <laughs> so I was lucky enough to, during that. Um, I will say, so I actually, I got married in my, right after my comprehensive exams. So I did manage to get married, <laughs> I did manage to go through that process. Um, and I was lucky that, that at the time, you know, my, you know, my husband was able to see kind of what I was going through and understand that, okay, she has to work and she has to do this for as, as you know, as you said, uh, 80 hours a week. And so we set things like date night and he was like, all right, date night, I close the books, I don't do anything. It's focused time to be with you. Um, so it, it is that challenge that you do have to, to manage. One other thing I will say to also make note and aware of that we haven't mentioned about is that when you're finished with your program, likelihood of you being in the same city or state is very is fairly low, right? There are only a few states, a few cities that have several institutions in them. Um, and so that's something also that you, as well as your partner and your family, anyone who's involved in the process will need to understand that there's a good chance that you will need to move and it may be a lot further away from where you currently are. So taking into mind where you choose to do your program, because the, you, most programs do not immediately, you're not gonna immediately go into that same program and teach there or be a faculty member at that institution. Yeah, so we're really in a rapid round now because we're running out of time, but. Uh, it is true. Oftentimes, you do not work where you get your PhD uh, program. So if you're on a tenure track path, it most likely you will move. So uh, there are opportunities if you happen to live in a big state uh, or you go to school in a big state like California, where I went, uh, there are m m hundreds of universities. But it always also depends upon the market when you graduate. That market will really also determine where you, where you need to go. So you have to be flexible with your location. Just real quickly, 
uh, there was a question about, are there opportunities for online or virtual PhD programs? I would say you should be on site for, you know, maybe your current home university, eventually you'll go back in person. So you may take classes online, but relocation is uh, uh, probably something to keep in mind if you're going to pursue this career. And so, okay, uh, let's move real quickly. Um, I, I think I'm towards the end, but real quickly, life now as a faculty member. Um, I guess, Dr. Pratt, you mentioned the Fulbright Scholarship. So maybe you talk about Germany or whatever, but why don't we give an example of a part of your life as a faculty member? Okay, sure. Um, so I'll try to be really quick. <laughs> so um, so as a faculty member, I we cross three main areas. So teaching, research, and service. And so I would say at any point in time on uh, most days, I am, I'm definitely doing teaching and research. And then there's some portion of service aspect to it. Um, so uh, teaching, so a lot of times you may not be teaching the same courses that you are specialized in. So that's something to be aware of depending on the department that you're doing, but um, that's also can be a beauty of it. One of the things I enjoy most, especially about IT and IS is that you get a variety of topics and areas that you get to become either an expert or knowledgeable on that particular topic. So that allows you to interact with students. It allows you to help students along the way as they're finding jobs and working with them um, in the future. I've actually had students where not only have I um, helped them to find positions or jobs, but even down the road have actually worked with them in their own companies and businesses. So um, one of the things I enjoy is that I do have the opportunity to do things like consult with other companies and businesses. So it's not totally just about being in academia. Um, I get to take my knowledge and provide that to other businesses and companies. And so I do have a portion of that where I'm doing that, where I'm a, a board member for an organization in which I can provide some of my IS knowledge and tech information with that. Um, and then I get to explore my research in so many different ways. And so the Fulbright was one that honestly, you don't have as many business majors um, perspectives coming into that. And so that makes it actually a really good opportunity for those who do want to seek out a Fulbright. Um, someone did ask if I had done it while I was a PhD student. I did not. Um, I did do it as a faculty member during my sabbatical leave. And so that allowed me to have an amount of time that I could focus in as a research scholar my Fulbright was completely about research. And so I interacted with the hospitals and um, universities within Germany for the year. Other, there are other types of Fulbright scholars where you can balance it with teaching um, or you can do completely teaching. So it just depends on where your interests are, what kinds of things that you want to do with that. But it was a great opportunity to build on my research and my stream and to expand my research into international um, perspectives and have that opportunity as well. So, um, so you get to do a lot of different things. I've since then I've done projects with students where I go in a number of other countries and we um, add infra infrastructure, IS infrastructure into countries that don't normally have um, as easily accessible. Yeah, and, and I don't really have time to talk about my experience, but you know, I was I would say a non-traditional PhD student. I worked for a while, uh, and so uh, it, this. My career path I'm choosing has allowed me to, uh, I guess, mix the I, uh, uh, traditional faculty role with the leadership role, and that's why I'm choosing to be the associate dean here at the business school. It's it's allowed me to pursue something that I like, plus see the world. So I've been all over the world, uh, and you get a lot of flexibility. But I want to say one thing before we go to Aurelia for the last question, and that is your journey does not stop when you receive your PhD degree. Your journey, you can take a breath when you achieve tenure. You know, you're able to do a lot of things after you achieve tenure. And that's when I started my administrative duties. So we can talk about that in another panel. So last question, Aurelia gets this question. Uh, I do see something in the, the questions from the prospective students about the GMAT or GRE. I would say do as much preparation as you can do that's possible to get the highest score that you can get. I, I believe the GMAT is still a, a useful assessment tool. The higher your score, the more opportunity you'll have for university choices. 
And the bigger university you can go to, the bigger program, the more financial funding will be available. Okay, last question, Aurelia. What advice would you give to a potential doctoral student? Um, how, I guess yeah. the question could be about what, what, what should they consider or should they take that next step? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing to consider is um, to make sure that you know or have a generalized idea of where you want to go into for research or for your PhD. Um, I'm pretty, once you get to know me, I ask a lot of questions and I'm also pretty nosy. So one thing that I started doing was I started emailing professors from different universities that seemed like I would be interested in their research areas. And I started following them on LinkedIn. I went to the university websites and I started information gathering to see what I think would be a good fit for me. So I started doing scheduling informational interviews with professors, they'll do it. Um, even students, I contacted students that were in uh, programs that I was interested in. And um, it's hit or miss because it is busy as a PhD student. And sometimes those emails might end up looking like spam. Um, so I had better luck on LinkedIn with getting in contact with students um, in programs, but that's the biggest advice is just if you have questions, uh, ask the faculty, ask the students, and also figure out, you know, what are some things that they, they've uh, struggled with in the program, especially the students, and seeing how, okay, if this is an area that um, is an area of improvement for them. How can I make that so that my experience in this program, if I were a prospective student, um, how would I navigate a similar situation? Um, because a lot of PhD students will tell you, okay, so this is something that I struggled with with my comprehensive exam. And then um, that's what actually helped me prepare for my comprehensive exam is that I realized after year one, I needed to start studying day one of year two. Um, so just asking and, um, you know, kind of figuring out is the time necessary or the time needed to be in this program something that's going to be able some uh, if I'm going to be able to incorporate that with my daily schedule that I have now or what changes will I have to make in order to do this PhD program. Um, so it's kind of a little bit of life planning um, when you decide to do a PhD. Okay, great. So uh, I know we're down to the last minute or so. So can we go to the slides, Christina? I have, there's a few slides. So thank you very much to the panelists for sure. I just wanted to make, uh, make sure that I cover the KPMG, the, the November conference, the annual conference. There are some requirements. That you'll see those listed on the slide itself. Uh, so if you meet those uh, minimums, you can apply. So let's go to the next slide. And so you can apply via the website as shown there at the phdproject.org and the deadline to apply is September 30th. Uh, and then you'll see some of the information about registration fee uh, and then how the application is reviewed. So um, I'm going to put my uh, uh, contact information. Now, there you go, stay connected. You can also reach out to Christina or we can put our emails on the chat. You can probably look us up at our universities if you have any further questions um, for us because I know we're, we're out of time. So thank you very much for coming today. And thank you very much for uh, our panelists and for sharing all of that great information.